And good evening. It is Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. And tonight we welcome you to the May edition of the Strive Alumni Town Hall. I am your host, Verna Hamilton. And of course, it would not be the same without my partner, my compadre, my brother in arms, my fellow Strive champion, my dude, my Harlemite, Terrence D. Byerson. You can unmute hey, yourself hey, hey. and say hi. There you go. Good evening, everyone. Thanks to everyone for being here. I'd like to give a huge shout out and say happy birthday to my man, Malcolm X. Today is his birthday. Absolutely. So, a, a special shout out to Malcolm X. Happy birthday. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to table set tonight because I'm very excited about the information that's going to share to put everything in context. As you know, we started our monthly live stream back in Terrence, July, 2020. And it was you, me and CJ. Hey, CJ. And we were full blown in the pandemic. We had pivoted to everything virtual and we wanted our alums to know that we were still connected. So we kicked it off. We've had a number of guests from them for the month. All of you have let us know the topics that you want to discuss. And we also take this time to share in public what you share with us privately as far as your good news. So without further delay, Let's kick it off by sharing the good news. And for those who aren't familiar with our good news, this is a list of individuals who have shared their particular milestones, whether it is landing that new position, earning that credential, a personal milestone, healing of a relationship, however you define good news, we are here to share it. And those, first of all, you know, every month we do a raffle. So you let us know, we keep in touch and your name goes into the raffle. We pick three winners for the gift card. Everyone appreciates the gift card. And so for April, our winners, of our April raffle winners were Johnny B, Kareem L and Ronaldo S. It's May, so I know you received your gift card and you're welcome. Keep up the good work, keep in touch, stay with us. Those who have shared with us good things, we just want to give you a mention, not going too deep into your business, but just wanted to let you know that we see you and we celebrate you. So heading it off, we see you Andre, Jenna, Damien, Gloria, Arbur, Acadio, Lamar, Christina. We see you, Rachel. Go ahead, Derek. Yes, Sean, Jabari, Christina, Jalissa, Chloe, so proud of you. Kendrick, Victoria, Saquon, Ariel, April, Jonathan, Navarre, Justina, Russell, Ephraim, we see you. And last but not least, Carlita. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. We celebrate you. We are excited. So one more thing is because this is our live chat. This is why you cannot do this by yourself. Although you've all seen me do it, but I'm so glad Terrence is here because he's going to introduce our guests. And I will, when you see me looking down it's because I'm looking to see what you're doing in the live chat. So this is live. Feel free to give a shout out. If you want to give a mm-hmm since you're not in the green room with us, do that too. We will insert your comments, your questions. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Okay, okay, okay. It's great to see everybody out there in Facebook land. Uh, so tonight our topic is going to be on voting voting registration, how important it is to vote. 
how important it is to vote for the upcoming elections, the DA, the mayor, city councils, what does that mean? And we have a special emphasis on voting for individuals that have been touched by the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, a lot of our friends, family, comrades, colleagues who have been touched by the general by the uh, criminal justice system believe that they do not have the right to vote or are unable to vote because of their last past transgressions. And that is not true. So tonight we have three, I'm going to call them experts, uh, you know, but they have, these are people that's in the knowledge that has to know about what it is to vote, uh, what they're going to talk a little about the elections is coming up. We also have for the first time in New York, ranked choice voting. They're going to speak on that. And I'm going to start by introducing, first of all, we have Mary Rinaldi. Mary is the Director of Advocacy at GOSO, Policy and Advocacy at GOSO, all right? Then we have Brandon J. Williams, who is the Program Director, Brandon, is that it? You're yeah, Holmes, uh, but Co-Director at Freedom Agenda. Brandon J. Holmes, I'm sorry, Brandon J. Holmes no at uh, Freedom Agenda. And last but not, Last but not least, we have Victor Pate, who is the New York statewide organizer for a campaign for alternatives to isolated confinement. And these great guests of ours will talk about voting, what it means to us, why we must do it, why we must register, and also the individuals that have been touched by the criminal justice system, their rights as it pertains, because they are citizens as well, and their votes are just as important as anyone else's. So we're going to start it off. Mary. Okay, Mary, can you talk about exactly what do you, like what, first of all, talk, tell us a little about what you do and why sure. this work so important. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, at GOSO, as you mentioned in the introduction, I work on policy and advocacy. And what that means, um, well, first, a little bit about GOSO. Similar to Strive, we work with um, justice-impacted young men uh, who are coming back from uh, prison or, or jail. And we also work with um, people in the community providing education and employment um, tools and workshops and tracks and just really kind of building a community for people to um, thrive. So, but because we work with a lot of young men who are just as impacted, and also I am actually indirectly impacted in that I have loved ones who were formerly incarcerated. Um, so this work is important to me on, on multiple levels. Um, but when it, when it comes to reentry, we obviously see, and I'm sure at Strive, this is also something that you see, is that there are so many barriers to building a life um, free from uh, the, just, the, the criminal legal system. And so it's really important for us to take those, that information and that experience that we're seeing among the people that we love and the people that we serve and work with, um, at other advocates in the justice transformation space to lobby legislatures to work on new bills that will reform the system or that will change um, aspects of the system that are unjust. So when it comes to voting, it's super important because so many of the legislators that we work with, they're legislators that get it, that are gung-ho about building out um, a better system um, of dismantling uh, really problematic um, elements and even really decarcerating, obviously. So that's why when we talk about voting rights and we talk about getting out the vote and educating on the voting front, it's so important because when you have really great legislators in the New York State Assembly, in the New York Senate, and also obviously as we're talking about New York City itself, New York City Council, the mayor, the comptroller, the borough presidents, it all matters because they have a a huge impact on the daily lives of New Yorkers, and especially on people who are impacted by the criminal legal system. Sorry. Uh, yes, and voting is very important. What we don't realize a lot of times is that in order to make changes, the voting, and it starts on the local level. It starts with our council people. It starts with our DAs. It starts there. We get enmeshed with the mayor and the president 
and the senators, but it starts locally on our local levels. That's why the city council votes are important, as well as the DA's vote, as well as the mayor's vote. So Brandon, can you talk to us about a little bit what you do and why do you think this is so important? Yeah, thank you, Terrence. <clears throat> so at Freedom Agenda, uh, we are a grassroots organization that is focused on organizing and doing leadership development with people who are formerly incarcerated and their loved ones. Um, so a lot of our work is very based in New York City. And uh, we are a C3 organization, right? Which means we're not a C4. We don't endorse candidates. We don't uh, do events where we try to highlight individual candidates and their issues. What we really focus on is accountability and transparency for current elected officials and anyone who's running an election, right? Just because we're not endorsing candidates doesn't mean we can't call out candidates that we see, right? Who are running elections or who are making promises and hold them accountable to the things that they've promised to their other people, right? Or people, you know, even our members who may live in their districts or be impacted by the issues they talk about. So what we really focus on is educating uh, people who are directly impacted to be at the table in conversations around what are the commitments we need candidates to be making? Uh, what are the demands that are important, not only on the campaign trail, but once they get into office, how do we actually walk them through the process of how they implement a lot of the promises and strategies that they talked about on the campaign trail? Because, you know, I don't think any of us are strangers to hearing candidates say, yes, I would definitely do this or I definitely support you know, these issues such as, you know, defund the police or Black Lives Matter. I believe that racial justice is an issue, but then they get elected and we can't really tell how them taking money from real estate developers or taking money from lobbyists is actually contributing to ending racial, you know, oppression uh, or systemic oppression in our neighborhood. So it's really about what are the problems that we're able to identify with people who are directly impacted by the issues and then how do we develop strategies and campaigns that will hold people, uh, whether they are elected now or being elected later, hold them accountable to actually delivering on those promises. And a lot of that is around three main areas. One, decarceration. How do we get as many people out of jails and prisons as possible by passing laws that make it so that they do not have to be incarcerated or that judges and prosecutors cannot incarcerate them? Two, how do we uh, make sure that the money, right, as we see people getting out of jails and prisons, how do we make sure that money is moved out of our local and statewide budgets for incarceration and into communities um, and the solutions and alternatives to incarceration that we all fight for? And then three, the last thing is uh, really improving conditions, right? So we talk a lot, and Victor's, um, I know, is going to talk about solitary confinement, but that the conditions that people experience in jails and prisons are still uh, important, right? As we get more and more people out of jails and prisons, we can't forget that there are, you know, even if there's not a thousand people in a facility today, there's 500 people. Those 500 people are still facing heinous, brutal, torturous conditions in the facilities that they're in. So how do we improve that uh, and the quality of life and the outcomes, right? When people return home and they join our neighborhoods again, how do we make sure that we're supporting people with that process? Um, so thank you for having us tonight and excited to get into this conversation. Thank you, Brandon. And the work you do is very important because we all, all of us, most of us, all of us has been affected by the criminal justice system. When our people go in and they do that time, they are not doing the time alone. We also are having that stress, worrying about them, when, worrying when they're going to come home, how they're doing there. So we all are affected by the criminal justice system if we haven't been actually been there primarily. Um, our next guest, Victor, can you please tell us what you do, a little about what you do, and why is this work important to you as well, my brother? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for my colleagues uh, to sharing this platform with me and everything that you all said. So uh, as a person that's directly impacted through the criminal justice system, um, you know, through the years and things that I have uh, personally uh, been uh, experiencing myself, right? 
my job at this particular time that I'm working under the uh, Halt Solitary Confinement Campaign, which is a legislative criminal justice advocacy organization. And our primary focus for the last eight years has actually been sure. on reducing solitary confinement, right? And making it more transformative and creating alternatives for people to not being tortured in our prisons and jails. But more, more importantly than that, right? Um, I also am an organizer and an educator when it comes to empowerment for people who have had criminal justice involvement in the political system. One of the things that I have found, you know, in my life and I've experienced that all of our lives are governed by a political decision, whether we like it or not. Everything that we do, everything that is, is arranged for us to do is through a political decision. People that have had previous criminal justice involvement have been placed in a marginalized and disenfranchised caste system. And of course, when you're not included in the conversations, when you're not included in the engagement and the civic practice, that means you don't have a voice, you don't have a vote, you don't have a say-so as to what decisions and policies are made that affect your life. I can tell you that for myself, you know, uh, uh, being engaged and involved in uh, criminal justice legislation work and talking and meeting with various legislators and talking with them about what the needs of the community are, they only pay attention to the people who are engaged and involved in the civic process for the most part. You don't get their ear unless they know that you're a registered voter, that you're engaged in some type of political engagement with the system or that you involve yourself in the actual voting process. I can say that for myself, that just doing this particular work that I started doing with the education and empowerment and engagement of people that have been formed and incarcerated that it is so very important that people, once they are uh, re-engaged back in society, they are part of the decision-making process. How do you get engaged and how do you involve yourself as a community member, as the taxpayer, because you're supposed to be have paid your debt. You're supposed to be given a fair and complete opportunity to fully engage in your society. By you not engaging in the civic process, you actually have no voice into the policies that are made that affect your lives while you are in the community. This is, to me, goes back to slavery, Jim Crow. It takes away your voice. It takes away your power to have a say-so into what happens to your life and what type of policies are put in place that will affect your life. I think that it's just so important for those of us who have had direct um, engagement in, in, in the criminal and justice system. This is just so powerful. And, and for me, this is really, really close to my heart. And I'm gonna say this why it's so close to my heart. <clears throat> Two things have happened. I was personally involved in the campaign that in 2018 gave people the right to vote that were on parole in New York State by having Governor Cuomo sign into a law, Executive Order 181, that actually gave people the right to vote that were on parole. Prior to 2018, this never happened. People were disenfranchised and disengaged. They did not have the right to vote. That was step one. We were successful excuse, in getting that. Excuse me, Victor, would you mind repeating that it, that executive order so I can? And, oh, okay. Executive. I just had that. I just had. I just had a question in the chat. Okay, executive order one eighty one, which was an executive order signed by Governor Cuomo in two thousand and eighteen, that gave people the right to vote that were on parole in New York State. Never before happened. Never before happened in New York. Based upon a conditional pardon after a person is in the community for 30 days, they would automatically be given, uh, not automatic, but they would be issued a conditional part that would just specifically purposes of people giving them the right to vote while they were on parole. Step number one, we've always had a three phase plan. Step number two, just recently, May 4th, we got the bill passed that now gives people the right to vote that are being released from New York State prisons and jails. 
That means that they no longer have to wait for the 30-day conditional pardon before they can register and vote. That superseded the executive order that was that was uh, signed by Governor Cuomo in 2018. So now we have a two-phase plan that's in effect. That one gave the people the right to vote that was on parole, 2018, 2021. Currently, people have the right to vote that are being released that are on parole that don't have to wait 30 days, that do not have to wait for a conditional pardon. And this is codified into law that you can now vote once you are released from prison. So this for me is very, very personal. I take this close to my heart because I've been personally engaged in the campaign to allow and give people their power back. That's where the power is. If we don't understand since we've had the right to vote, why would they keep coming after the vote? I think that should be an indicator. Why, since we were given the right to vote, do they keep coming after the vote to dilute the vote, to try to make it hard for people to vote, or to keep voting from people from voting on suppression and oppression? It should be something that's in there that tells you that there's a reason why they don't want you to vote. So gotcha. I, I know there's so, questions going on. No, 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 no. So I, I am, um, I'm, it's, this is, this is rich, but I'm going to pause because I saw Mary with the hand claps. Thank you for the animation. Uh, and this would be a good time to share the materials that you sent about who can vote. And let's see. There we go. So the current laws, if I'm if I'm hearing you, you can register and vote in New York if you are on probation, if you are on parole, if you were not sentenced to prison or had your prison sentence suspended, if you served your maximum prison sentence, or if you were convicted of a misdemeanor. Um, the reason why I ask this, and, and feel free to chime in, Mary or Brandon, is because one of the biggest myths that we have that we're trying to bust tonight is that if you have been involved with the legal system at all, you are ineligible forever to vote. And so what would you say <laughs> to people that still believe that? I mean, Therefore, yeah, go ahead, Mary, or oh, one of my other colleagues. Um, I mean, Victor is completely right. So because of that most recent um, executive order that Cuomo signed into law on May 4th, now everyone who may have had... Oh, well, just a correction. Sorry, go ahead. The law, the law that gave people the right to vote upon yes, release, sorry. that was yes. the one that was just recently yes. signed. The law that, he, that Governor Cuomo signed on May 4th. So basically the only, if you've had any involvement with the, with the criminal legal system, um, the only, now the law is, the only way you can't vote is if you are currently incarcerated for a felony conviction. So that means, um, and there's been some work that Brandon has, has also helped on um, with a coalition that we're, we're a part of called the People's, Account of, uh, the People's Coalition for Prosecutorial Account Accountability, where even if you are detained, um, and pre, you're in pretrial detention, that you you still have the right to vote. And that's the responsibility of the Board of Elections, the New York City Mayor, and the Department of Correction to ensure that you have um, access to the vote. But going back to what Victor was really um, emphasizing, if you are home and you are back, you get to vote There's in New York State. Um, and it's a really huge... Uh, a huge win. And obviously we're gonna keep pushing for restoration of the voting rights while people are um, incarcerated. But um, as of today, in the June 22nd primary, if you're registered as a Democrat, because it's a Democrat primary, you can vote. Yeah, and I, I would just add a quick comment, um, just a quick point of clarification for the 
folks who are in uh, any pretrial detention or any uh, alternative to incarceration or alternative detention programs, they are do still have the right to vote. The requirement, though, if you were actually detained pretrial or remanded, is that you have to do it by absentee ballot because the jails mm -hmm. do not have physical polling sites. Um, so you have to request an absentee ballot. And the deadline for that is June 15th. So you have to get it. The deadline to request it is one week before the actual election will happen. Um, and then at that time, you know, it, it's, it's really on whoever's custody you're in, right? It could be if you're outside of New York City, the Sheriff's Department, but if you're in New York City, the Department of Corrections, and sometimes that presents a challenge. So advocates, you know, like Victor, Mary, myself, there's different community groups that if you know somebody who is currently uh, on Rikers Island or in any pretrial facility, um, there are advocacy groups like Mary mentioned that are working on ensuring that people actually get their absentee ballots. One of the challenges is also that you have to be registered already to request an absentee ballot. So then there's another deadline. So th there's still so many, like Victor was mentioning, so many hurdles and obstacles that they continue to try to trip people up with to stop them from voting. But um, if you are not sentenced and in uh, state prison, if you're not sentenced and in a prison, you have the right to vote. Um, no, despite all the hurdles and challenges, you have the right to vote and should have access to voting. That's huge. So right now I'm sharing the materials from the Freedom Agenda. There are some important dates and you can see who can vote. To vote in the primaries, you must be registered with the political party. Of course, uh, here at Strive, we do not endorse any political party. We provide you the information and you vote your, con your conviction and your, your beliefs. Uh, here, huge news, people on parole, <laughs> as well as with conviction records can vote, underline, see it's in big red letters, can vote in New York state. However, you must register to vote by Friday, May 28th. Today is May 19th, so you have exactly 11 days and the registration, you can register online. Just like you're watching this alumni town hall, you can register online at nycvotes.turbovote.org or visit a board of elections office before Friday, May 28th. And this is in preparation for the primary that is on Tuesday, June 22nd. But let's just, let's just work on people going to the call to action. Every month we have a call to action. So now that you know that if you are not physically located in a facility serving a sentence, you are eligible to vote. Is that correct, my, my subject experts? Okay, okay, try not to mess up here. Uh, and you must register for a political party to vote in this upcoming primary election. And you need to register by Friday, May 28th. Okay. Is yeah, there... I have a quick, oh, just go a quick ahead. question. I was just looking at um, looking at this sheet here. Um, I think I provided one of the documents that I actually have, and I know Brandon spoke about uh, requesting of the absentee ballot. There's the sheet, the one that I provided has the dates and stuff, and Brandon mentioned some of the dates on when you have to request the uh, absentee ballots by also. You do. And of course, for those of you that are watching, you know that any materials that of course, we have the video that you can watch over and over again, but if you have any questions about anything that you see in our town halls, you can always email me at thehamilton at strive.org or tbyerson 
And that would be B-Y-E-R-S-O-N at strive.org. All right. Yep, and just one thing I wanted to add around the absentee ballot. So if you have also, if you have concerns, since we're still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, if you have concerns about that, it's still available for um, New York City voters to request an absentee ballot um, because they, they would prefer not to go in person to a polling place. So um, mm -hmm. the links that you are gonna potentially share later um, or in a follow-up to this, um, it's just, nycabsentee.com and then okay. the instructions are there too. I can pull that up. Yeah, on how you do that. Yep, there, let's see. Oh, live from the chat. This is amazing. Us on the ground have to disseminate this information. Education is missing and we must spread the word to ensure all can vote by the deadlines. I agree, it is amazing. And that's why we bring amazing people to the town hall. Um, because all of you are not shy in letting us know what you want to know about. And uh, we appreciate Brandon, Mary and Victor coming into this space. And because quite frankly, everyone isn't ready for live live streams. So you know when the people actually do the work because it doesn't matter the format, they're passionate about the work and not only are they passionate, they're knowledgeable. So with that, um, I have a question that Victor told us how he came to this work. Um, Mary alluded to how it plays in to what she does. Yet Brandon, you have not given us a glimpse of how you came to this work. Yeah, um, I come to this work. Uh, I'm not formally incarcerated. Um, I have, you know, a long history of incarceration in my family um, from folks being on Rikers to folks being in state prisons. And uh, my younger cousin, or sorry, older cousin in a federal facility, um, but spanning up and down the East Coast from Atlanta, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and New York. Um, so I, I've seen the way incarceration uh, puts stress on families of incarcerated loved ones and also separates families, right? Even when people return home, some of the stigma, some of the challenges to people being able to get back into housing situations that their loved ones are in. If you're in public housing, the bans on that, um, you know, being told you can't, you know, if your family has moved from the South to New York, being told that you can't leave the state um, and really feeling like you're isolated, not only in the rural South, but also with none of your family around when you're returning home and trying to restart your life. So that's what brings me to this work. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. And so in full disclosure, uh, I am the cousin of Ruben Hurricane Carter, who was not only a prize fighter, he was, um, he was incarcerated wrongly. And he spent not only 20 plus years working to prove his innocence, but once he was released, he then spent the rest of his life working towards getting others who were wrongly in prison free. So uh, even though, as Terrence said earlier, you may not be the person who actually was in, but when one, someone close to your heart goes in, everyone goes in. So I am very happy to share the information that those who thought that they were forever locked outside of a system, that you make it your business to make your voice heard. Do what you need to do to register, get on the books, show up. Uh, I believe you also said, Terrence, that all politics are local and that many of the things that people march and protest against, if we do not engage in local activities, 
uh, there's a lot at stake. And you cannot get excited about national happenings and then let local things happen in and around you. So with that, um, we are broadcasting not only to Strive New York, High Strive Atlanta, High Strive Philadelphia. Brandon, you're in LA. Say hello to Strive Second Chance out there. Uh, we're everywhere. We're, 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 we're a national we're a national movement, a national family. So with that, uh, turning to the upcoming, I'm looking in the chat and, and I'm feeling the alumni. It said, okay, all this rah-rah sounds good. Big ups to all of you, uh, but why should I care? Why should I care? What's at stake? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot to to say there. So I'm just going to give you one example, um, which we've discussed. Right, that this year we are seeing ranked choice voting come to New York City, um, and for something as big as the mayoral race, which, like, arguably, I and I don't think. I'm just biased as a New Yorker or saying this in, in front of all New Yorkers, but this is the biggest and like most coveted mayoral position in the country, right? This is the mayor of New York City is the most important mayor in the country. Um, and because of that, we're looking at so we have a pool of so many candidates, right? There's over three there's over three progressive or you know quote unquote progressive candidates that people are looking at then there's another three that people are saying oh these folks may be you know a little bit more moderate whatever whatever the case may be there's six candidates running on one party line right um and many many more that are still throwing their hats in the ring and we're going to be allowing new yorkers for the first time in history to rank their choices, right? So it doesn't just default to whoever got the most, you know, individual votes. This is actually a process that's going to show us whether or not we can improve democracy as we understand it in America, right? This isn't just an experiment for New York City, but this is huge for the implications it could have at a federal level too with ranked choice voting, where we're not just boxed into it's, you know, this or that. Um, a lot of people, you know, we talk about people saying, oh, I feel like no matter who I'm voting for, it's just the lesser of two evils. We hear that a lot around the presidential elections and we hear it around local elections, too. But this is an opportunity for us to really show uh, through the, a political system, through the government system, show how do these candidates stack up against our values and not just a simple yes for this person and I'll accept whatever else they bring to me, but let me rank these people and show who is most closely aligned with me and my vision for my community and neighborhood. So I think not only is ranked choice voting something that makes this year super meaningful, we're also looking at like 85 to 90% of our city council members are term limited. That means they cannot run for reelection, even if they wanted to, even if they had all the money under the sun, they can't run for reelection. So we're really going to be transforming the entire face of New York City's government in these elections. And it starts with these primaries where we're going to identify who is going to be on the ballot uh, come this fall. So it, this is a monumental moment for changing the way voting works in New York City and potentially across the United States. And also, we're not just talking about voting for one or two people. We're talking about re you know, revamping our entire city government. So this is a really exciting opportunity for people to be heard and show where candidates stack up against your values. Um, Thank you. I have, so, I have one. I have one thing I just want to add to that. And I'll make it really quickly. Um, and here's here's what I, I I come back with. And you know, why, why should I care? What difference do it make? And blah blah blah. I'd like to take you back to the historical platform from the beginning. Why you should care? Our ancestors, our people died, were killed, were murdered, were tarred and feathered, were treated inhumanely 
just because they wanted to vote, just because they wanted to be treated like human beings and wanted to feel like they had a choice in the decisions that was happening in their lives. Why should you care? Because people have sacrificed so much for each one of us to even be where we are today, to even have the opportunity to say the things we are able to say today. People have sacrificed their lives. There's a reason for you to care because you have an opportunity to make a difference. And I think that it's a disservice to your ancestors, it's a disservice to your people who've came before, who have given you a platform to stand on, upon whose shoulders you stand to be able to be where you are today. That's why you should care. And with that, I'm going to, thank you, Victor. I'm going to share um, the announcement that you put in our chat. See, I'm working both chats, Terrence. I want you to, want you to see the skills over here. Uh, Victor wants you to know that New Yorkers for Full Restoration will be in Harlem this Saturday, May 22nd, on 110th and 111th Street in Malcolm X, or Lennox for those, you know, old, old school, um, from nine to two, doing in-person voter registration and giving out voter information. So if you don't want to use your Wi-Fi like that and you need to get outside, uh, be sure to stop by Lennox, Malcolm X, uh, between nine and two, just take a stroll, start at 125th, you know, say hello, wave, and it's just, it would just be a 10, not even. Even that long. Could, not even that long. <laughs> you could, you could take, you could take the scenic route, you could bike, you could grab a friend, you can just, as we say, come through from nine to two. See how I rhyme, Terrence? You were asking, you were asking about bars. I think that was a bar. I think that was a bar. And, and I wasn't and, even trying. I'm, I just I'm I gonna just, come out and see you too, because I have something at King Towers that day as well. So I'm that, it's right around the corner. I'm gonna come see you. Um Vern, I want you to put back up the uh the slide where it said the the, the voting that we had, the mayor, controller, and all that. And if anyone yes. can just in a quick blurb. For, for my young people out there that may not know exactly what are the duties and the obligations and the jobs of the city council person, of the controller, of the, uh, uh, of the mayor, just to let us know how important these elections are and why it's important to vote for these individuals that's also. The borough president, the Manhattan district attorney, and, the, and we're talking about these are, the, these are the local elections besides the mayor, that is going to be happening uh, in November, and with the primary coming up soon. So either one, anyone, that would that would be June. The the election, the primary, the primary, but the election is in November. Right. Yeah, I'll, but I'll let Brandon and Victor jump in on some of this. But I just wanted to emphasize that um, the reason the primary is so important in New York City is that while, as Verna said, it's super important. Obviously, that like, your vote is your vote. Who you decide to. Um, what political party you decide to register as is, is yours. But one reality about New York City is most of New York City is, is registered as Democrats. So um, what's happening on June 22nd, there will be a many, many, um, a lot of the really contested tight primary races um, may turn into or mean that in the general election on November 2nd, where the Democrat runs against um, you know, a Republican or vice versa, and maybe there's an independent in the mix, um, that usually the Democrat who wins the primary will end up winning the general. So that's, that's just a note. Again, as Verna said, this is really about making your own choice as a voter, but it's, it's helpful context to have as a New York City resident. Um, but I'll pass it to, to Brandon or to Victor to talk about um, the power of the mayor and, and maybe, you know, whatever uh, role um, elected office that they want to emphasize. Yeah, I just wanted it to be clear that 
our main thing was to make sure that people get into the game. <laughs> that yes, 100%. Those, those, that, those that thought that they were forever bench, that they can get into the game and it's time to suit up and get in and let's go. That's so for sure. That I'm gonna meet myself. And I just want to just make one mention and, and, and forgive me if I, uh, I'm going to play my senior card if somebody already did. Uh, the only position that is not going to be using ranked choice voting is the DA's uh, uh, race. So the candidate that's running for DA is going to be voted by normal voting process. Every other position is going to be using rank choice voting and I know that's a whole whole nother topic and I had about four or five and I'm still trying to figure out how this thing works um okay I, coming in I, yeah coming in live from the chat live from the chat this is way and so important and it's great that strive is having this forum many only care about presidential elections because it's highly publicized we need more of this to reach more people uh Another comment, there's misinformation of the powers of the president while these upcoming elections in New York have direct impact on our lives, but so many don't see or know that. So I'm going to let you all know that people are listening. So with that, um, the question on the table is, what do these positions do and how do they impact the lives of New Yorkers? I guess I'm going to take a first stab at it. Um, and and Terrence kind of sort of like set the platform with kind of sort of like explaining, you know, although this is considered local politics, you have to look at it in a different lens. So when you begin to build a house, you have to have that foundation. You have to have something upon which that, that house is stand upon. When you look at it in the context of these positions that are up for election, you can look at it as this is the foundation upon which each level is depending upon to operate. In other words, from city council, okay? So say for instance, the, the person that's representing us or, or you in a city council or whoever that participant elected official is, is kind of sort of like a liaison to senators and assemblymen and uh, 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 congressmen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that person who is in the city council is basically uh, your representative who is kind of sort of like plugged in to all the other moving pieces of the political system in his respective district, whatever, because because it's broken down by um, congressional district. Each congressional district has a um, city council member that represents X amount of, I don't know, um, I'm going to say areas, so to speak. And it is his job to deal with the constituents in his particular district. Whatever the issues may be, that the community that are residing in his particular geographic location is his responsibility to see to the needs of the people. So of course, you want someone that's going to be representative of that particular district to be someone who's going to have the interest of that community in which he was voted to represent. This gives him access and also the constituency of that particular area to address all type of um, policies, issues, concerns of the community, monies, uh, uh, parks, things that people may need in the community, you know, uh, traffic lights, et cetera, et cetera. A person that's in a city city council is to me, he's like, um, I guess you could say he, to me, he's like a liaison, you know what I'm saying? And he has a responsibility for his particular district, his constituency, and it is always good to make sure that you have relationship, but more importantly, that you know who that person is, what their platform is, what they believe in, what they stand for, and what their history has been in the community. Because more than likely, people that have been elected to a city council comes from a district 
that you live in. He might even come from your particular block. So you might have a sense of who that person is, their history, their integrity, what they have done, what kind of contribution they have made to the community. So this city council person is someone who, for me, is a liaison and is a voice for the community. But more importantly, he has access to the the politicians who actually make policies, who uh, vote for policies that will affect your particular district. I'm hoping I'm not doing such a bad job at this there. <laughs> That's amazing. I was just uh, not, 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 kind not, of simple. Not, yeah. not, not at all. I just wanted to make sure Mary or and or Brandon talk about the, the district, district attorney. attorney. I'm, gonna let, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make one addition to what Victor was saying about city council members, and then I'll let Brandon do talk through what a district attorney does and how much power they have, because it's quite a bit um, in all five boroughs. Um, but just on city council members, the other thing that's unique about um, our city is that city council can pass laws. Mm -hmm. So your city council member is voting on laws that will affect potentially affect, well, will affect mm. your life as a New Yorker. And that's just mm. a really important element of their responsibility. Mm. They also can um, put pressure on the mayor when it comes to the budget. So the New, York, New York City Council has to vote on the New York City budget every year. And um, one of the things we need to always keep in mind is, is a wonderful saying, and I, I don't know who originated the saying, but I heard, the first time I heard it was in a Minnesota uh, from a Minnesota city council member um, in the Twin Cities. And he, he said, you know, a budget is a moral document. It shows exactly where your, where your true values lie. And so that's another really important power that um, city council members have in terms of uh, approving or disapproving of a budget that the mayor's office sets forth for New York City. Thanks. Thank you for that, Mary. And Victor, of course, thank you for that. So Brandon, we want you to talk about the DA, the powers they have, why is it important to vote for the DA? Yeah, so a little bit of background um, on why Nari and I uh, have worked around this Manhattan DA work. We formed a coalition, a grassroots coalition with many other organizations in New York City who had members or clients um, or were themselves formerly incarcerated and prosecuted by the Manhattan DA to talk about uh, the People's Coalition for Prosecutor Accountability. So a district attorney, it is uh, essentially the, it is the one elected official, the one position in elected government that is prosecuting cases, right? So when people are being charged with a crime, when someone has been accused of a crime, it is the district attorney's office, right? Regardless of where you go um, in New York, in New York state, there may be a district attorney's office of uh, Orange County, for example. But in New York City, because we've got the five boroughs, we have five separate district attorneys for each of for one for each of the boroughs in New York City. So uh, the district attorney essentially says they will collect all of the evidence and information that is brought to them. They will even do their own independent investigations into uh, alleged crimes or claims that people make so that they can build a case to then prosecute somebody. Now, the district attorney is a very strange position, right? Because they're never looking to defend somebody's innocence right? Their goal from jump is, I am here to prosecute crimes, right? That's why I'm called a prosecutor. I'm never a defender. I'm never here to defend somebody and say that they didn't do something. So whether or not, you know, in, in a system where people should be presumed innocent until proven guilty, it's strange that we have a government that allows us to elect somebody who goes into every encounter presuming someone is guilty and looking for ways to prove that they are guilty. So the district attorney is a very, it's very different from many of these other positions we're talking about, the mayor, the borough president, city council, because they're not actually passing laws. Their job is to uphold laws that have been passed. So they are strictly about, was this law broken? Was a law broken in this case? Can I find evidence saying yes? And how far can I take this until I either get this case dismissed 
or we move this to sentencing, or we ask for a plea deal if we think that we're not going to be able to get enough evidence. So some of the bullet points on you know what a district attorney does, they decide whether or not they're going to charge someone suspected of a crime. Um, they decide whether they're going to try to get that person who maybe may have been accused of a crime. They're the ones who issue to the judge, hey, I don't think that this person should be free to stay in their neighborhood or stay in their home. I think they should go to jail while I collect evidence to prove that they are guilty. So they actually make that decision and say, if you're going to go to jail or if you're going to be released on bail or bond, they're actually asking the judge, they're telling the judge what they think should happen. And then the judge will make a decision based on the information given to them. But most often the judge is going to say, well, I'm an elected official too. And you are also an elected official. This person has not been elected by anybody and may have done you know, a serious crime. So I'm going to go with your guidance. If you believe that you have enough evidence for them to be detained or for them to not have bail set, I'm going to trust you and go with that. Um, they can also use different programs, right? So one thing is that district attorneys have the authority to say, judge, we are requesting that this person get uh, drug counseling and treatment rather than going to jail or prison for possessing drugs or using drugs. They have the authority to do that. More often than not, we don't see those systems being used at the scope and capacity that we wish so that we could free people from incarceration, but they do have the authority to do that. Um, and then they also have the authority to investigate uh, other law enforcement agencies or elected officials, right? So there was a lot of talk, um, something that you know people may have seen was the current Manhattan District Attorney, Cy Vance, decided that he was going to look into Donald Trump's tax records and figure out like, okay, was Donald Trump com committing tax fraud? Right. So they can open their own investigations and look into things on their own, too. Um, and they can also take people's property, their money, your belongings, if you've been accused of a crime. And, and even if you've never been actually convicted of that, right, if, you, if you've just been an accessory to something or you're related, connected to it in some capacity, they're able to seize things that they believe may benefit their investigation. And then they keep those assets. Um, and that's a conversation for another time. They keep those assets to boost the coffers of their office, right? So when a rainy day comes and they don't have money, they're able to say, oh, well, we got this car that we seized from a bad drug deal. Uh, so let's just auction off this car and see if we can get a few thousand dollars for our office. So there's so many things that a district attorney can do. But it's not one of those, dis those offices where you would schedule a meeting with the district attorney and tell them, hey, I want to pass this law. Can you help me draft this law to get more people out of prison? That's just not their job or their role. Their role is to go into court and find evidence to prove that people have committed crimes or to try to figure out plea deals um, or just say, you know, there's not enough evidence. We've got to dismiss this case. So their whole role is around whether or not people have committed crimes and can they prove it. So that's why the district attorney's position is a very important race that we should all be paying attention to um, and the implications it has, right, for our communities, which are over-policed, which are underfunded, right? If we know that we've got five district attorneys in New York City, all with the goal of essentially prosecuting people, how can we make sure that the people we are electing are making commitments to prosecute less people? to decriminalize certain offenses or say that they're not going to request bail at amounts that they know that our neighbors and our families cannot afford? How can we hold them accountable to using the authority that they have uh, in a progressive way that pr promotes freedom, right, and transparency in government? Very good. Thank you so much for that, Brandon. I'm glad that you were able to articulate that to all our listeners out there because that's important as well. Um, you guys have done a wonderful job. Uh, for anybody that wants information about any of your organizations, Go So, Urban Just Freedom Agenda, or um, uh, uh, Victor, by all means, can you let the, uh, let the world know how they can contact you or contact somebody if they wanted more information? 
Hey, you got also, Freedom Agenda's e, uh, website right there. Uh, we are at the Urban Justice Center in Lower Manhattan, if you're ever looking for where our office may be. Um, but we do work in all five boroughs. And I just put my, um, okay. my, my organization's um, website on there also. Um, and I, I'm just like, I just want to just say one quick thing thing right that and this is why Brandon kind of sort of like articulated everything pretty well that's why you need to know who these candidates are that's why you should be paying attention to all these candidate debates that they've been having the last month or so to kind of get a sense of who these people are they're asking for their votes and what are their platforms and what are their history and what are they going to you know what are they going to do what do they say they're going to do when they get in office because you need to be an informed voter not only do you need to vote you need to be an informed voter so they've had a lot of uh forums and DA forums and, you know, city council. For, I mean, each position has had forms. So people, I urge you to pay attention, to watch, to listen, to ask questions when you have an opportunity to ask questions and just be informed and be plugged in. Right. So I am going to exercise executive privilege, chat, it is 7.01. Do you give me 14 more minutes to wrap this up by 7.15? Stand by green room. <laughs> oh, we have negotiation. Okay. I have the 15, so it is 7.02. So with that, I am going to give a recap of what we discussed today. Um, and I'm also going to put into the chat, the green room chat into the YouTube live chat. And this is a video for rank choice voting. Oh, see, someone said part two. Someone else said go to 715. Got you. Okay, I'm going to 715 and I'm doing a recap. You have in the chat, I'm talking to you, looking here. I am about to drop in the chat a video on ranked choice voting. And for those of you that are, you learn by experiential learning. I will also talk through the, the link that I'm putting in. So it's https colon forward slash forward slash vote dot NYC. Forward slash page. forward slash ranked dash or hyphen if you prefer choice dash voting. And that is coming live to you right now because that's how we do. All right, for the coalition, Victor, so I don't mess up your coalition. I'm gonna drop it in the chat while you say it. It's the coalition against isolated confinement. New York campaign, New York campaign against isolated confinement. Okay, thank you, sir. Yo. New York campaign against isolated confinement. And their website, Campaign Against Isolated Confinement, that's coming into the chat. And their website is www.ny, get the dot, dot nycaic dot o-r-g
And if autocorrect will get out of my business, that's coming to, <laughs> that's coming to the chat now. There we go. And we have, I'm going to share. If you needed to visit the Alliance of Families for Justice, they're on West 126th Street. And we also have the Freedom Agenda. Their website is FA. Get back to this chat, fa.urbanjustice.org. And the main thing is, before we go, I'm going to review the important dates. And you know, you can always, I'm leaving this up long enough so you can make a photo of it, screenshot it, but it's not just enough to screenshot it. Please use the information and get involved. Okay, that's the Freedom Agenda website in the chat. How am I doing so far, panelists? <laughs> Excellent. Very well. Okay. Still laughing and well. let's see. But I want to, before we go, the last thing we do before the sign off is to make sure you mark these dates. Um, okay, so this is how it rolls. Friday, May 28th is also the day that Strive collaborates with the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. You can contact uh, Martha Marquez, or you can send an email to connect at strive.org and say that you know someone or you yourself are experiencing food insecurity. You want to be part of that. You sign up. You this, look, I got your whole, I have your whole Friday, May 28th planned out if you procrastinate. But you're not going to procrastinate because you today's the 19th and you have until the 28th to go to nycvotes.turbovote.org. But should you like, you know, the rush of adrenaline wait until the last minute, you are going to sign up contact Strive so you will be on the list for food pickup. And then you will go online to make sure that you're registered to vote by Friday, May 28th. Then you can start voting early starting June 12th, but don't forget that the primary is Tuesday, June 22nd in preparation for the general election later this month. So it is 7.09. So I have just enough time to, <laughs> to thank all of our guests, uh, to thank Mary Rinaldi, to thank Brandon Holmes, to thank Victor Pate. I hope that this, uh, this live stream, of course, it'll live on YouTube. You can play it over and over. Um, let's see, any more? Any more feedback from the chat? Because they were, okay, I'm great. You guys are wonderful. All right, so I'm great with the YouTube live chat. I'm great with the Zoom live chat. Uh, we have no technical difficulties. All the Wi-Fi is solid. So again, uh, the key voting dates, you're going to go to nycvotes.turbovote.org. You're going to do this before May 28th. Don't wait until the last moment. You already heard that if you are not physically incarcerated, you can vote. And those of you who are not, those of you who have had no 
involvement with the justice system is all, you can register to vote too. How about that? Uh, do that by May 28th. Again, early voting period is between June 12th and June 20th. If you plan to do an absentee ballot, that request deadline is June the 15th. So steps in sequence, register, request absentee ballot if you need to, and be ready on primary election day, June 22nd. You have enough websites to go through. You have the open invitation to come through this Saturday to Malcolm X um, from nine to two on 110th and 111th streets. So you may see Terrence. I don't know, because you know Terrence gets around. He's, he's, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. That's why he is our community relations manager, because he manages the community. He is everywhere. And so with that, we're going, to, we're going to leave out like we came in. I am thanking Terrence for making sure that I'm not doing this by myself. It is our esteemed pleasure to serve as uh, your ambassadors of the Strive Alumni Association. Two apps before we go. Don't forget to subscribe to our Strive YouTube channel. Uh, let us know what topics you want to see in the coming months. And for those of you who did not already do so, we have a Strive alumni group on LinkedIn. Now, you do know that you don't have to wait until everything opens up to start looking for positions. We are still doing our virtual job club, waving at Team Awesome. We still do our virtual job club every Tuesday and Thursday at 10. Self-directed job search on Fridays at 10. You know how it's, how it's done. It's strive.org forward slash remote. Click on job club. Currently, they tell me there are more positions open than candidates. So if you are looking, if you're not, come on, come on, let's get connected. Uh, you heard from them earlier this year, they connected almost 900 people to new employment in a pandemic. That's right, that's what we do. We're here to make sure that you get to where you want to be. In other news, we will be back in our asset building sessions. Terrence, I believe you're on deck or is it CJ? No, it's, it's CJ. Uh, it is the seven streams of income because our commitment to you, we heard from you that you want to come out of this pandemic better than you went in. So we're going to pick up the discussion. We also have our weekly newsletter. So again, if you are not receiving the information hot off the presses, comes out every Friday, give me an email at bhamilton at strive.org or tbyerson at strive.org. It is 714, so you gave me to 715. So I'm going to stop now. And Terrence, you can take us out, take us home, turning it over to you. The only thing I have to say is that I would like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to our esteemed guests. You guys did an amazing job. I appreciate you guys coming in here and doing this for us because as you guys are in the same business as us, and that is to serve people. And your information is invaluable as it pertains to us in our city, our black and brown community. And we need guys like you to stay on the ground. Like Brandon, you keep people accountable, you know, keep them accountable. Uh, Mary, you make sure that you keep advocating and creating those great policies. And my man, Victor, you stay on the ground, brother, educating and making sure that we all good. So I appreciate you guys and thank you so much for being here tonight. And so with that, it is 715. That is the May edition of the Strive Alumni Town Hall. We will see you next month on June 30th. In the meantime, stay connected, stay engaged, and let's all keep striving. Good night.